Let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this holy season of Advent. We ask that you give us the graces we need to always be conscious of the great gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to open our hearts to draw near to him, to be filled with his love. Help us to be your sign, your witness in the world around us, the truth of the gospel. May we generously and joyfully serve you in our homes and in the world. And may we build up your kingdom here on earth. We pray for the coming of that kingdom as Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Mary, Queen of Apostles, St. Joseph, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> well, thanks for coming. I know it's a busy time of year, and so I just wanted to give a couple of prefatory remarks about uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Anytime that you say we're having a lecture, uh, you think of something maybe more academic. But I want us to make a distinction between information and formation. Information is data, and it's abstract. Formation is incarnational, it's concrete, and it deals with how I apply the information to my heart. So what we'd like to do uh, in this Men of God series is focus on formation. Now, I think Holy Family is one of the best catechized parishes I've ever found. On the information level, uh, we have an incredible, uh, incredibly well-educated, uh, well-catechized parish. Formation-wise, we have not been exempted from original sin. So, formation, we've got plenty of room for improvement, right? And that's what we've got to do, is focus on how do we take everything that we know about our faith and apply it to our lives, to living that faith better, to expressing it uh, in a more full way. So with that kind of as the context for what we're trying to, to accomplish, I, I want to move into uh, the first kind of practical uh, principle uh, that's not just an application to the topic at hand, but to, to all formation, which is a business maxim, uh, something that uh, those of you out in the corporate world might have heard uh, some business guru tell you before, but I'm going to tell it to you uh, now in the setting of the church. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats eats strategy for breakfast. Now, where I first heard that was an interview with the CEO of Microsoft, okay? And uh, the new CEO of Microsoft was showing a reporter around their headquarters and had all sorts of zany things in their headquarters. And the reporter, business reporter said, I, you know, I've, I've never been to a corporate headquarters that had volleyball courts and and, and all sorts of other things. Uh, you know, it's just kind of zany. And, and the CEO looked at him and said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So what they were trying to do is create a corporate culture that was creative, that thinks outside the box, that encourages individuality and uh, isn't uh, bound to, well, this is the way we've always done it isn't bound to nine to five cubicle life. Right? So uh, what the corporate world has discovered in this maxim 
is something that applies a thousandfold to our living out of the gospel. Do I need to prove it? Let me ask. Does my life resemble more one of my neighbors who is not Catholic or somebody I find in Butler's Lives of the Saints? You say, oh, well, Father, that's maybe setting the bar a little bit too high. Except the last time I checked the church's baptismal liturgy, each and every single one of us, by our baptism, is called to be a saint and nothing less. So I think it's a fair question. Am I living the American lifestyle or the Christian lifestyle? Because they are not one and the same. There was perhaps a time in our nation where there was significant alignment between uh, the American lifestyle and the Christian lifestyle, although even at that time, one would have to, to put the footnote that the way the Christian lifestyle was envisioned was very much a Protestant uh, vision of the gospel rather than a Catholic vision. But there was definitely significant alignment. But now, I think the divergence is fairly obvious. So let's ask the examination of conscience. Do I look like my neighbors in the way I spend my time? TV, Facebook and the internet, sports, the way I spend my money, house, car, cable TV, vacations, or do the ways I spend my time and my money look like the way a saint would? That's a challenge. Who is influencing whom? Because the Christian is called to be the salt of the earth. Are we changing the flavor of the world around us? Or is the society in which we live determining what our lives look like? And I think in all humility, we'd have to say that we're far better Americans than we are Christians. Which way should the Mississippi River flow? From north to south or from south to north? Which way should this cultural influence flow? From the gospel to the world or from the world to the people who say they're following the gospel? You see the problem? Right? So we have to have an honest assessment of the ways in which we have allowed the great American dream to color the way we live. And by so doing, we have absorbed a culture which is not only different than the Christian culture formed by the gospel, but nowadays, in many respects, hostile to a Christian culture. The church has had many strategies in the past 50 years to try to combat this trend of secularism in our culture. We've had pro-life strategies. We've had pro-family strategies. But the last time I checked, abortion is still legal in this nation. And if you say that marriage should be between one man and one woman, you're in risk of being accused of hate speech. So let me ask you, who is influencing whom? Where have all of the strategies, all of the bishops' documents, all of the task forces, all of the committees, where have they gotten us? Because we've not tackled the culture. And, may I remind you, until you're sick of it, culture eats strategy for breakfast. 
culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's the reason we launch all these great initiatives and they go, womp, womp, womp. They fall short of the goal because we haven't allowed our lives to be shaped in such a way that we create an authentic Christian culture from which a position of strength, we engage the world in a way to be light and salt. So that's the goal. That's the goal. And that's why it's not information, but formation. It's about forming a Christian culture in our homes, in our parish, and from there to influence the world. Because we've had far too long of the world influencing us. So this has to be about more than holding certain principles to be true. An abstraction isn't going to keep me safe on dry land as a tidal wave roars by. I need something more solid. So let's talk about the ways that American culture and the church have interacted over the years. We had a good start. And we think about what the most important holidays on the American calendar are. Fourth of July, Labor Day, Memorial Day. Okay. Those are purely civic. But then come the religious ones. A generic religious one, Thanksgiving. Then specifically Christian ones, Christmas and Easter. And then specifically Catholic ones. You know which ones those are? Valentine's Day and, and St. Patrick's Day. How could you forget? Did you? And Halloween would be another one. Yes, yes, Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, the vigil of, of all saints. Right? And more money is spent Halloween, St. Patrick's Day, and Valentine's, and then you throw in Christmas. Those four Christian holidays, three of them specifically Catholic, account for a massive amount of the American financial uh, sector, don't they? You know? Uh, I didn't realize the full extent of this until I was uh, in my last assignment, and as, as part of the, uh, the role there, I, I was involved with some civic things, and one of those things, this crazy thing, there's a company called Red Bull, right? I'm, I'm not getting any money for mentioning their name tonight, okay? Um, and Red Bull did this event called Crashed Ice, where they put this big ramp up by the cathedral, and people go skating down, and it's, it's crazy. Uh, and after the first one of these events, uh, the city council had a, uh, a number of listening sessions with the, the neighborhoods and with the business people downtown and said, was this something that we want to do again? And the West 7th Street uh, pub keepers said, let's put it to you this way. It should be no surprise that the biggest day uh, of the year for, for us is St. Patrick's Day. And having crashed ice was like adding four St. Patrick's Days to the calendar, right? So they were pretty pleased, right? But I'd never thought of the financial impact of St. Patrick's Day. I mean, Valentine's Day, you know it, right? You see it for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Woe be to you if you don't show up with chocolates and flowers, right, for your wife, right? Uh, and make a reservation for dinner because mom shouldn't have to cook on that day, right? So the financial impact of this... So still, even today, there are ways that American culture is impacted by the church. But let's look at that. Let's be honest. When I was a kid, on the secular calendar, it said St. Valentine's Day. Look at a calendar today. It doesn't say saint on it unless it's a calendar your parish gave you. It's as simple as Valentine's Day. Saint Patrick's Day? Well, he's not Mr. Patrick yet. The Irish have kept the saint in there so far, all right? Uh, but Saint Patrick's Day, let's be clear, in Ireland, it's a solemnity and a holy day of obligation, and the people go to Mass, right? Now, in, in a classic example of what I've been talking about, about the river flowing backwards, Ireland is now having green beer on Saint Patrick's Day something that they learned about from us, 
right? And they're making it a big party instead of going to Mass. So St. Patrick's Day has become the greatest occasion of drunkenness in our nation, even surpassing the Super Bowl. And Valentine's Day, all of you, I'm sure, celebrate in a, in a lovely way with your wives, but let's face it, it's a massive occasion of lust uh, in our country on that day. So two saints' days become about lust and drunkenness. So you see how what starts and what's, what's profoundly an impact of the church on the culture, the culture has a way of, of losing sight of the roots and letting it be twisted. And that's where we have to do some work to reclaim it. So then, I'd like to, 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 I promise we are getting to Christmas one of these days. In about 10 days, actually. Uh, but two principles that I'd like you to think about. First of all, progressive solemnity. Progressive solemnity. Right? Who here has a son who's an altar server? Okay? You ask, ask your boys. They'll tell you about progressive solemnity because they can tell you on which day, you know, what's going on because of how many candles are lit in the sanctuary, because of which processional cross gets used, what color of cassocks they wear, what type of incense is burned, and which vestment the priest puts on. They can tell you exactly where we are in the ebb and flow by these externals. And that's what they're meant to do. Whether or not we have flowers in the sanctuary, whether there are lace or gold trappings around the altar, all of these things are clues that the church gives us for where we are in this progression of solemnity. Now, American culture, unfortunately, treats every day as a holiday. All right? Uh, I was appalled when the 10th anniversary of 9-11 rolled around. And really, it was treated like any other day. Right? Uh, the, they tell me that in the old days, on November the 11th, the 11th day of the 11th month, at the 11th hour, there would be a moment of silence. And my mother said that if you happen to be in a shopping store at that time, everything in the store fell silent. And there was a pause, and there was a remembrance. Because we had a culture that recognized there were moments to be somber as well as moments to be celebratory. Right? Now, the funny thing about... Uh, November the 11th, is the reason why that day was Armistice Day for World War I was because it was the feast. Again, here's the church's culture. Veterans Day traces itself back to the fact that it was the feast of St. Martin of Tours, who was a soldier saint. And the Germans were ready to surrender a day or two earlier, and the French army said, no, we will accept your surrender on the 11th because St. Martin is the patron saint of the French army. Right? So that's how profoundly this, this influence you know, goes on. But you go anywhere on November 11th today, is there a moment of silence at 11 a.m.? No. And even on the 10th anniversary of the most horrific terroristic attack on our nation uh, since, Paul, since Pearl Harbor, you know, nothing. Nothing. Life went on. Life went on. And that's where our, our culture needs to have a sense of progression. Of progression. And we don't. This is due to our affluence. Right? We live in the most affluent society in the history of mankind. Right? Which it should cause us pause when we read in Scripture that the root of evil is the love of money, 
and that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. It should give us all pause when we realize that we all, in terms of, of, of this, are rich men. Even I and a priest's salary, all right? Not, not considered rich next to Bill Gates, but considered next to the rest of humanity? Yes. Yes. So this is the problem. When, when we have disposable income, when we have confused wants and needs, I mean, how many times do you have to, to try and explain that to your kids? But I need that new toy. No, you don't. You don't need it. You want it. We live in a culture that confuses desire and necessity. What do we need? Very little. Very little. I need a roof over my head. I need a very good heater. But I don't need X number of thousand square feet. I don't need a swimming pool. I don't need all of these other things. Those are wants. And when people say to me, oh, Father, we'd love to live near church, but, you know, those houses are just way too small. I say, really? Let's go back to the 1950 census and see how many people lived in each one of these houses. And I think what we discover is it's not that the houses have shrunk. It's the desires have grown. Right? So we need to be careful. Living in this affluent culture, I, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to say that, that uh, no one would really object if, if, if we classify this as a materialistic culture. And with the materialism comes a throwaway mentality. And with that comes this mentality also of every day is a holiday because we can afford it. We can afford it. You know, it will, it will come to the time that an Amazon drone will deliver uh, to your doorstep something just as the email receipt is arriving uh, from your one-button push on your smartphone for having ordered the thing, you know? Uh, it's not just fast food anymore. It's instant gratification on every front. And the church is not about instant gratification. Uh, I, I remember uh, when I was a fairly newly ordained priest, I was dealing with a uh, young couple preparing for marriage. And at the time, it was only 70% of engaged couples in the Catholic Church that were living together. Only 70%. Uh, and I had this talk with this young couple that I had established a good relationship with them. And I said, now we need to, to talk about how you prepare for, for marriage. You know, uh, you know, living together. Are you living together as brother and sister? <coughs> Snicker. You know, they, they no father. You know, okay. All right. Thanks for being honest. Right. So I'm going to ask of you uh, that if you can't physically separate to different residences, that you abstain from sexual relations until your wedding. And the guy said, but Father, it's, it's, it's six months out. Six months out. Do you know how hard that is? His fiance kind of elbowed him. And I looked and said, six months, buddy, is a walk in the park. <laughs> okay. Right? But we live in this culture where I want it, and I want it now. And who's going to stop me? Well, who should stop me is me. Who should stop me is me. My will exercising my will and not letting my passions go unrestrained. And so that's what's at stake, really. If you want to look at this whole idea of progressive solemnity, it's not just about the externals. It's not just about uh, window dressing. It's, it's about a sense of self-mastery. It's about a sense of, 
of preparation that's necessary before celebration. The other thing at stake here is rhythm. I got rhythm, you got blues. No, how's it go? I forget. Anyway, there's a rhythm that is set up that even the ancient pagans recognized, a rhythm to the seasons. They had the myth of Persephone to explain how the four seasons were at work in the world, right? Uh, that, that Persephone was the daughter of the goddess of nature, Demeter, and she gets abducted and taken to the other underworld, and finally there's a, a truce worked out where she's restored to her mother, but only for half the year. And so the fall is when she leaves her mother and all of nature begins to mourn. The winter is when she's away from her mother, and so the, the nature, the world of nature is dead. And then spring, she's restored to her mother, and so all of nature buds forth a new life, and the summer is that flourishing of her being with her mother. Seasons. Even ancient pagan religions recognized a rhythm. So now, the church's rhythm is uh, on a daily basis. First of all, we have something called the Liturgy of the Hours. The Liturgy of the Hours is, is the prayer that all priests uh, promise to pray five times a day, and, and most sisters as well, and monks in a monastery or a cloister nuns would pray seven times a day. And that goes back to uh, the early church where Christians would stop and pray seven times a day. Every Christian. Because that punctuates the day with prayer. That throughout the whole day, I'm called back into a mindfulness of the presence of God. And that my life exists within the context of my relationship with God. And so the Liturgy of the Hours, the, the chanting of the Psalms, uh, uh, that, that is the way the church uh, keeps that alive, that rhythm of prayer. And how beautiful that... As, as I'm saying night prayer on this side of the world, someone in the church on the other side of the world is praying morning prayer. It's this unceasing hymn of praise to God and lifting up the needs of the world. And for the lady out in the world, eventually it developed that they couldn't do the liturgy of the hours. Most of the people were not literate. So they, they gave them how, how many psalms in the book of Psalms? 150. How many Hail Marys in the rosary as it was before the addition of the Luminous Mysteries? 150 Hail Marys. That was the layperson's psalter. That was their psalm book, was they could pray those Hail Marys, those beads in groups of 50. And that was their way of, of sanctifying the day. And then, of course, every, talking about culture, every town, every village, every city was structured clustered around the feet of its church. And the bells of the church would ring at dawn and everyone would pray the Angelus. The bells of the church would ring at midday and everyone would pray the Angelus. And the bells of the church would pray in the evening at sunset and everyone would stop whatever they were doing and pray the Angelus. Do you know still on Irish TV today, at 6 p.m., if you're in Ireland and you're on the TV, I forget what, it's the main TV station, state broadcasting, right? It's 6 p.m., there's nothing on the TV. Uh, they've moved away from an actual prayer, but they'll put pretty scenes up and there'll be bells ringing in the background. So if you wanted to pray the Angelus, here's a reminder on mainstream television that it's Angelus time, Right? And that's a shadow of it, what it once was uh, from, from Irish Catholicism. But still, even today, in the 21st century, that much at least remains. So that rhythm of the day the church wants to give us. The, with, the rhythm of the week, right? That Friday was a day of penance, right? Now, it used to be in the early church, they fasted twice a week. You and I, under current legislation of canon law, fast twice a year, not twice a week. All right, And our fast is pretty puny. 
one full meal and two snacks not to equal a meal. Right? That's, that's, I mean, that's not even a strict diet, let alone a fast. Right? And that's twice a year, twice a year. And the early Christians fasted twice a week. Twice a week. In fact, there was some discrepancy as to which days of the week that they fasted on, which is why St. Monica, uh, when she was traveling from, from North Africa with her son Augustine, they went to Milan in, in northern Italy and met St. Ambrose. St. Ambrose baptized Augustine. Then they moved down the peninsula to the capital, uh, the ancient capital of Rome. And St. Monica writes back to St. Ambrose, says, uh-oh, I, I I got to have your help here. I'm fasting four days a week because the days they fast in, in Rome are not the same days I'm used to fasting. So I'm, I'm fasting on the two days that I'm used to fasting, but I'm, then I'm also fasting on the two days that they fast here. What do I do? And St. Ambrose said, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's where that comes from. Right? But that keeping of Friday as a day of the passion, right? It goes back to, to, to getting a sense of what's going on here. How many days did it take God to create the world? Six, right? And Friday is the sixth day. So Saturday is the Sabbath, the day of rest, and our Jewish brothers and sisters uh, take that as their day of rest today. When Jesus comes... He finishes his work of redemption on the same day that the work of creation was finished, Friday. He had his Sabbath rest in the tomb on Saturday. And he rose from the dead on Sunday, the first day of the week. A new creation in the light of the resurrection. Sometimes they call it the eighth day because they see that is the completion of everything went before, which is why baptistries and baptismal fonts are often octagonal, eight-sided, because of the eighth day. So this rhythm of the week goes back to creation and is closely paralleled in fulfillment in the work of redemption and then all of a sudden, we come along. And what happens? Well, when I was a kid, even the TV guide, that's before all this other stuff, there was this physical thing. You remember from the newspapers that came, it was called TV Guide, right? It had Sunday as the first day of the week in TV Guide. But now, we don't think about Sunday as the first day of the week. We talk all about week end. Week end. And the way the week end usually works is Saturday is the fun day, and then Sunday, well, Sunday I do everything that I have to do before the week on Monday begins. Sunday becomes a cleanup day, chores, errands. Sunday is the biggest shopping day of the week. When I grew up, now I grew up in the South, you couldn't shop on Sunday. There'd be one gas station in the neighborhood that was open, and, and the grocery stores, some of them would be open, but even within the grocery stores, certain aisles would be roped off. You can get milk today, you can't buy magazines. You can get bread today, you can't get pet food. Fido has to wait till Monday. Now, of course, that would be sacrilege today because pets are worshipped more than, than treated better than humans. But there was an understanding. There was a profound understanding of the rhythm of the week. And we've lost that. We've lost that. Someone said very poignantly, and, and I think in light of this whole discussion about culture eating strategy for breakfast, they were, they were at, onto, onto something profound. That they said, when the church gave up abstinence from meat on Fridays, it lost the war. 
You go, really? I mean, that's one tiny little discipline. It's not even a matter of doctrine or dogma. It's one little tiny disciplinary thing. And they, this person made the point. When the church's arm reached all the way into the kitchen, the heart of the house, and dictated what the menu was, there was a Christian culture. There was a Catholic culture. Because if, if Holy Mother Church dictated your menu, right, and wasn't there in the heart of the house shaping things, then everything else was going to fall into place as well on this rhythm. So how do we get back to Friday being a day of the passion, Saturday a day of Our Lady? Why? Because Mary waited in hope on Saturday for the resurrection. And then Sunday as a holy day, as a day of rest and prayer, a day for family and fun, a day for service and th for those in need. But not a day like any other day. How do we get back to first Friday and first Saturday devotions where we again let the rhythm of the church be what shapes our lives? And only then does it make sense when we speak about Advent and Christmas, Lent and Easter. And only then will you see it makes as little sense to have a Christmas party in Advent as it does to eat chocolate bunnies and search for eggs on Ash Wednesday. The church has seasons of preparation and celebration. Preparation and celebration. Now, we have to tread carefully. The fact that Christmas carols started by my calculations, three weeks before Advent did this year, right? Mid-November, you're already getting mainstream secular radio stations playing Christmas carols. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Now, I'm ticked that at midnight and the 25th of December, they go <laughs> and switch. But the fact that the joy of the incarnation can still switch what a pop station plays night and day for six, seven weeks, again, it tells you we still have an impact there. It's gotten twisted, but there's something there to work with. The fact that you can't, in our public schools, have a Christmas party, but that Christmas is a federal holiday, huh. does that ever strike you as odd? So, there's something to work with. There's something to work with. But we have to get it right. You read what the church has to say about Advent, and it's not about decorations. It's not about parties. It's certainly not about shopping. It's not about caroling. It's about prayer. It's about silence. Think about it. The sad thing is Advent is the noisiest time of year, you know, uh, with merrymaking. It's a happy noise that, that goes on everywhere. But in the church's language, Advent is a time of silence and prayerful waiting, a time of longing and expectation, not a time of gratification. And so... How do, we, how do we work with this? We're not going to be able to call up. I mean, I suppose if you had enough money, you could buy the local radio station and say, no, we're, we're going to do the Christmas carols from December 24th uh, through uh, the entire Christmas season. Uh, but you might lose your advertisers and go bankrupt. I don't know. But how can, can those of us just uh, on the front lines here internalize these principles in our own homes even if we can't change everything going on around us. Because if we can do it in our own homes, then we've stopped the Mississippi flowing north. And it's only a matter of time before we can get it flowing south again. 
Now, the way that Advent is observed as preparation has a payoff in the way Christmas is observed. I mean, I have to tell you, I've seen it. December 25th at 5 p.m., Christmas trees at the curb. And you want to say, it's just beginning. It's not over. Just like Lent. If the church says fast and do penance for 40 days, the church also says, now we're going to celebrate for 50 days. But you come up to somebody in mid-May and say, Happy Easter. They look at you, what? That was weeks ago. No, it's still going on. You know, and in, and in Catholic cultures, the greetings change for how you see someone on the street and you say hello to them. There's a different greeting for when you're in the Easter season than the rest of the year. So how do we begin in, to internalize this ourselves so that eventually we construct a way to influence the culture around us rather than be influenced by that culture? Because as long as we let that culture shape us, we lose. We lose. And Christmas becomes about Santa Claus. And Easter becomes about the bunny. Instead, if we're able in our own homes to form ourselves in the right way, not being the Grinch, you know, when, when someone wishes you Merry Christmas on the street, you don't go, Happy Advent! We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to, uh, you know, turn into Ebenezer Scrooge and, and, and uh, we want to work with what's out there. We don't want to reject it, right? Uh, but at the same time, as much as we're able to control things, you know, if I own my own company, my Christmas party is going to be in the Christmas season, not in Advent. The 12 days of Christmas, those are not the 12 last shopping days. But I think that's what people think. The 12 days of Christmas, they go from Christmas to Epiphany. So how does the church flow? So we start in this Advent. Advent is the new year of the church. The whole cycle of meditating on the mysteries of the Lord's life begin with the first Sunday of Advent. Unfortunately for us, it usually falls in the shadow of Thanksgiving. And so we're still all having that tryptophan hangover from Thanksgiving turkey. But that's New Year's, is when Advent begins. And through Advent, there are little, little spikes. There is St. Nicholas Day. You know, when children would set out their shoes. And if they were good, they might find a little treat in their shoe in the morning. So everybody knows about Christmas stockings, right? That's simply the, morph, the morphing of this custom of the Christmas shoes on St. Nicholas Day. But the gifts weren't on Christmas. In a Catholic culture, gifts were given on St. Nicholas Day and on Epiphany. On Epiphany. Did you know that in Italy, there was no such thing as Santa Claus? But there was a figure called La Bifana, that represented this celebration with the three kings bringing gifts on Epiphany. Those were the days for gift giving. Christmas was the day to meditate on the fact that Jesus Christ is the best gift we could ever receive. That's how a Christian celebrates Christmas. Is we, we meditate on how Jesus Christ is the best gift we could ever receive receive. And everything else around it needs to somehow lead us closer to that meditation and pull us away from all the stuff that could distract us. So how could we apply this kind of progressive solemnity through Advent? You know, 
maybe you buy the tree at a certain point, and we'll call it an advent bush, how about for, for the beginning <laughs> stages? And then maybe on another day, you put the lights on it. Maybe on another day, you put the ornaments on it. And then on another day, you finally plug it in. Maybe you start with your empty stable on the, on the hearth. And Joseph and Mary are in the kitchen. And each day of Advent, they move a little bit closer. And then the three kings are even further away. Maybe they start in the garage, I don't know, or the basement. Because uh, they're not going to arrive till January 6th for Epiphany. You know, how do we, we emphasize the sense of expectation, the sense of longing, the sense of waiting, the sense of preparation on, uh, on St. Lucy's Day? The name Lucy means light. And so sometimes it's on St. Lucy's Day that you flip the lights on. Or Gaudete Sunday. That's my personal. I won't do Christmas carols until Gaudete Sunday, this coming Sunday, because that's where the church sets aside the, the violet or purple vestments and for that day puts on rose. Please, not pink. Rose, all right? Right? So if the church says Gaudete, which is a command, it's an imperative in Latin, rejoice. So, all right, so we're getting closer to the main event. The church doesn't want us to get ground down by all that penitential preparation, so we have a little spark here on Gaudete. Just like on the fourth Sunday of Lent, we have Leitare. It's, again, it's a, it's a spark of, of just a, a glimmer. We're getting closer to the celebration. So for me, it's, it's I can put on the Christmas carols from Gaudete Sunday on because the church has said we're now entering. We're cl so close we can taste uh, that we're getting closer to that celebration. And then when Christmas comes, whether we've used Jesse trees or Advent calendars, or of course the greatest is the Advent wreath, because you see those candles get shorter and shorter and shorter. It's sort of like the sands on an hourglass. You know, it marks time in such a tangible way that we're getting closer and closer and closer. And however you've prepared through Advent for it, when Christmas arrives, let Christmas be Christmas, right? That, that last year or the year before, I, I forget when I read the statistic, was the first time, the first time in, in American Catholic history, more people went to Christmas Mass on Christmas Eve than on Christmas Day. And I got a problem with that. Because unfortunately, for a lot of people, it's get it out of the way with. But the idea that we're now on a trend that will someday see almost no one at Mass on Christmas. What does the word Christmas mean? The Mass of Christ. Christ Mass. That's where the very word comes from. But a couple of years ago in Chicago at a mega church. In Chicago, Christmas fell on a Sunday. So what did they do? They sent all their, their members, uh, tens of thousands of you know, members in this megachurch, they sent them all a DVD and said, we're, we're not having services this year. Just you enjoy your family time and plop in this little DVD with a, with a, a peppy little message at some point whenever it's convenient for you. That's where we're already at. You thought it was bad that Target was opening on Thanksgiving evening. We, we're, we're a lot further down river than that. So it is that, that when Christmas comes, the mass, the celebration, the celebration of Christ's birth by the perpetuation of his incarnation in the Holy Eucharist. That's right. The Holy Eucharist is this whole mystery of Christmas right here given to us. Right here given to us. And then maybe if we have free time during those days of the Christmas season, 
Instead of sleeping in, maybe we go to Mass. Because that's the way to celebrate Christmas, is by coming and being with Jesus, whose birth we've celebrated. He came to be with us, so we're going to make an effort to be with him. In those first days of, of the Christmas season, what we call an octave, it's like an octave on a piano. It's eight, like those, that eight-sided baptismal font, right? The eighth day. So, so any of you see the movie Groundhog Day? Okay, then you understand what an octave is, all right? And an octave in the church's liturgical year is Groundhog Day. You're stuck. Okay, wait a minute. You get up the next day, and we're doing yesterday all over again. And you get up the next day, and we're doing yesterday all over again. For eight days, it's, it's like in those days when we had record players, and they would skip, and they'd get stuck, 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 and then you have to swat the, the, the needle and hopefully not scratch the record, and you, you, you get it going again. That's what an octave is. The church says this is so important. We're not just going to keep on moving. We're going to pause and savor for eight days. Pause and savor. Just soak up the moment. You talk to uh, a sports player that's just won uh, a big game. Maybe you see him on TV, Super Bowl. They've just won. And just they're on the field, and they just don't want to leave the field. Because they know as, as soon as they go to the locker room, yeah, there's, there's, there's more celebration that's going to come and all that. But I just want to stop and soak up this moment. I want to live this experience. I don't want it to end. That's what the church is doing in an octave. Take that joy of Christmas. Take this beautiful reality of the Son of God made man, of the Savior of the world born to free us of our sins and open for us the way to eternal life. And wow, how do you just keep moving past that? And the octave of Christmas is unlike other octaves. Sadly, now there's only one other octave left, Easter. But you know, Easter's octave trumps everything. Nothing comes into it. Even a solemnity. Uh, you know, if Easter was really early, Holy Week and, uh, and Easter Week trump everything. The reason why Pope St. John Paul II's feast day is not on his death day, which is the normal day for a saint's feast day, is they realize that nine times out of ten, it would fall during Holy Week or Easter week, and it would get trumped. Uh, and so they said, no, let's put it on the anniversary of his pontificate, and that way we'll get to celebrate it every year because, because these octaves trump everything. But Christmas's octave is a little bit peculiar in that December 26th is the second day in the octave of Christmas and the Feast of St. Stephen. How did that saint sneak in there? I, th I mean, John Paul II's a pretty great guy. And he couldn't sneak into the Easter octave. How does Stephen sneak into the, the Christmas octave? Because Stephen is the first martyr. Hmm. Do you see how Mother Church moves immediately from that joy of the birth of the Savior and immediately to the first martyr? Huh. Why? Because it's the joy of knowing our Savior and his love for us that makes us willing to shed our blood for the gospel. It's not a set of abstract intellectual principles that we shed our blood for. Okay, and then the 27th of December, the third day in the octave of Christmas and the Feast of St. John. Well, now how did he sneak in there? He's the beloved disciple. He's the one who rested on the breast of Jesus at the Last Supper. He's the only one of the apostles not to be martyred. And he's there to show us that 
intimacy with Christ in the Eucharist. There he was with Christ at the Last Supper. And then he was not martyred so he could be that link to tell the generations to come. And then on the 28th, the fourth day of the octave of Christmas and the Holy Innocents. Those children from Bethlehem who were born around the same time as our Lord, but by order of Herod, were massacred as he tried to get our Lord. And we honor them right around the birthday of our Lord. And it reminds us of the sanctity and dignity of human life. And then the 29th, we're still in the octave of Christmas, but we get another saint, St. Thomas Beckett. And now, wait a minute. Okay, all right. Here we got, I can go, I can get Stephen, I can get John, I can get the Holy Innocents. We're, we're all scriptural there. They're all uh, closely related to Jesus. Who is this medieval bishop saint, and how did he cram into this octave of Christmas? Well, in the Middle Ages, there were four great pilgrimage shrines. Jerusalem and Rome, Santiago de Compostela in Spain, the shrine of the, the uh, Apostle St. James, and Canterbury. Ever hear of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales? Those are pilgrims on their way to pray at the tomb of St. Thomas Becket, whose feast we celebrate within the octave of Christmas. Why was he so special? Why did he catapult up to the top ranks. He represents the church's perennial struggle between church and state. Thomas Becket was the bishop who opposed King Henry II of England, uh, who tried to make the church uh, under the thumb of the government, which is why when another King Henry six Henrys later, Henry VIII, when he decided that the church was coming under his thumb, one of the first things he did was go to Canterbury and destroy the tomb of St. Thomas Becket. And so St. Thomas Becket is right here, providentially placed in the octave of Christmas. And I think he becomes a reminder to us who's influencing whom? Are we going to give the culture around us the upper hand? Or are we going to stand firm? And are we going to be the ones that influence the culture around us? This is the perennial struggle between the church and the world. From these days of the octave, the octave concludes on January 1st, the secular new year when we honor Mary, Mother of God, because Mary is the beginning of, of redemption. We celebrated her immaculate conception. She's conceived without sin because she is the pathway through which salvation comes to the world. So she's our new beginning. And then we go on <clears throat> to Epiphany with the three kings, which represent the pagan world, the whole world, the corners of the world. Tradition said that one of the kings came <clears throat> from Asia, one from Africa, and one from Europe, uh, that, that they represented the continents all coming together. But it's the pagan world. It's not the chosen people of Israel. The salvation is for the entire world. <coughs> and that's the 12th day of Christmas, that this joy of the birth of the Savior is a joy that should be for the whole world. Someone should write a song about that. Joy to the world. Oh, yeah, they did. Okay. And then the Christmas season used to continue all the way to February 2nd, Groundhog Day. <laughs> but if you open up the Roman Missal on the altar, it won't say February 2nd, Groundhog Day. It'll say February 2nd, the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord in the Temple. Because the completion of the Christmas season is this remembrance 
of Jesus in fulfillment of the old covenant that said that the firstborn male has to be dedicated to the Lord, has to be presented, and there has to be a sacrifice that's made. A couple little birds. The SPCA would not be happy. But that, the mass begins on that day, you supposed to, with a procession and a blessing of candles. It's called candle mass, the mass of the candles. And it was 40 days from Christmas to Candlemas. And all those 40 days were of celebration. And still today, we read at the beginning of the Mass, it has been 40 days since we celebrate the birth of our Savior. There's still this continuity. And so maybe what we can do, don't keep your trees up, it'll be a fire hazard. But maybe at least, at least we can do little things to perpetuate this joy of Christmas. Maybe for the 12 days of Christmas, you space out the kids' Christmas gifts. Give them one on Christmas, one the next day, whatever, to, to get, create this sense of, of celebration. Because don't let go of the joy of Christmas a minute sooner than you have to. But we're much better. You know, when we think of this, it's so funny. Catholics are really good at Lent. We're really lousy at Advent. We're really lousy at Christmas. And we're really lousy at Easter. Lent, we do really well. Why is it we do penance better than celebration? But we need to start doing that. It's one thing to say, this is a season of preparation and and we're going to try to not get swept up in the, in the tidal wave around us of, of the way the world is, is, is treating this time. But it's perfectly within my capability to construct how I celebrate from December 25th for those 12 days and in some way keep alive that joy all the way to February 2nd. Even if it's just that in your homes, after everything else has been taken down, the nativity scene stays there until February 2nd. And every night when you say your family prayers, you gather around that nativity scene and just have that remembrance that we're still basking in the afterglow of the celebration of our Savior's birth. So that's what I'd like to tell you is at stake in, in how we use our time, how we let the church and these celebrations guide us. And there's a richness to be found, but it's a challenge. It's hard to celebrate for 12 days. And not to celebrate in a way that's simply self-indulgent, because that's not a very holy celebration. But it's worth the effort to discover how to celebrate. And by getting this right, we start to reverse the whole way that culture is influencing us or we're influencing the culture around us. Because culture eats strategy for breakfast. So let's make sure it's our culture. Thanks for your attention. God bless you.